And we have been in a series of lessons called Do You Love the Truth? Particularly, we're looking at Daniel. And uh, at the moment, we are looking at the episode in which Nebuchadnezzar threatens the servants of God with a fiery furnace. So, you'll turn to Daniel. That's where we'll be. And, you know, the big picture... Uh, before I get into that, the big picture on Nebuchadnezzar's fire is that God has a fire too. <laughs> so that's the secret here. Nebuchadnezzar's fire and God's. <laughs> that's what you got to reckon with. And so uh, the big picture here is he has already appointed some faithful Jews to positions of prominence within his government. And then he goes about making a law that would, would require them to worship a false god, and they don't do that, which gets them in trouble with him. So that's the real fire that is present in this account. And the reason that that fits into the big picture uh, or the, into the question of do you love the truth is because, as you will see, we're all in some amount of heat. <laughs> Maybe not the seven times burning furnace that Nebuchadnezzar threatened these individuals with, but some heat, some fire. All Christians are under fire. Um, that's the way that it is, and it always is that way, and it's not going to change, actually. But that can be a useful thing because it can purge useless things or impurities from the gold that is your faith. And you learn from it to endure. You learn from it patience, right? So there is a, a good thing there. But certainly for the time, it is quite unpleasant and the big picture is, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar has a fire, but God has one too. So what do you love more? Do you love the truth more than you love comfort? You know, getting along, being comfortable, fitting in, uh, not garnering ire, no pressure, no circumstances in life. That's the real question, and that's why it fits into, do you love the truth? Because when you look at these individuals, they certainly did. And yet there are individuals who did not and should have. And that's our lesson. So we're looking here at the account in Daniel 3, but we are bringing forward the uh, account from Exodus chapter 20 to be part of it in Daniel 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, breadth 6 cubits. Uh, cubit is um, from the elbow to the fingertip of a grown man. Ish. So, rather tall. Multiple stories building, we would say, here. Somewhere between, right, 6 and 10 stories. <clears throat> He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So in the middle of a plain, an, a structure of this size would be seen from all about. As soon as you came over the mountains uh, and entered into that plain, you would see this thing standing out, right? And, uh, you know, he sends out to all of the various offices to have them show up for the dedication of the image, which is to say the statue. An image is a statue. That was always confusing to me as a kid. I don't know about you, but I remember reading in my family's Bible, which was the Catholic Bible, to have no graven images before me. And I said, Mom, what is an image? Uh, and she was pretty hard-pressed to explain it, actually, um, which makes sense when you're Catholic, because they do it all the time. They've got statues of everything, likenesses of everything, everywhere. They're in plain violation of this commandment. But that's what an image is. An image is a, 
it's like you know a bust like the bust of beethoven on your piano i'm sure you all have that at home um <laughs> it's his likeness it's his image it looks like him that's the point so that's the meaning it's a statue in the likeness of something probably a man you might have some guesses about which man it would be <laughs> They stood before the image Nebuchadnezzar had set up at the dedication. Now, so far, so good, right? I mean, uh, we're not told what it's an image of or whom or what it's for. But, you know, if you want to build a statue, you can build a statue. It's not a sin to make statues, which is the way that the Mormon countries go. They, they have a prohibition on any kind of statues. That's why they are not... Are, I'm sorry, not Mormon. Did I say Mormon? Muslim countries, honestly, same difference, but Muslim countries uh, have a strict prohibition on images. So you will not see in their art depictions of people or animals. You will not see statues in their countries. It's absolutely forbidden uh, in any form. No coloring books, no, you know, uh, things of this nature. That's why the art, uh, the Moorish art, you know, and things of the ancient Near East are geometric patterns and things of this nature is their basis because, they, you know, it's forbidden to have a likeness of any living thing. <clears throat> the fear is that that becomes idols. Yep. But in and of itself, having a statue is just a thing. Setting up the statue, having a dedication, people come and join in this, you know, fuddy-duddy affair of the government. Hey, we're happy about something we accomplished or did in our nation. That's okay. But it becomes a problem. The herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, all you peoples, nations, and languages, when you hear the sound of these instruments, we will play every kind of music. Then you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Okay, now we have a problem. Not even the music is a problem. The problem is fall down and worship the statue that the king has set up. Now, no pressure, right? <laughs> a 10-story tall gold statue is not cheap, is it? Built by the king at public expense, this is not a small thing. Uh, by their standards, of course. Our government spends a lot more, <laughs> with a lot less <laughs> permission. <laughs> but no, truly, this is no small thing, right? Uh, literally quite large, very expensive, went to a great effort. They put forth this proclamation bringing everybody who's important, everybody who's anybody is there. And then the king says, all right, now that you're here, let me spring on you why I brought you here, which is you are going to engage in this idolatry. So, yeah, that's pressure. Everybody else is going to do it. You know it. They're all going to do it, even though they don't believe in it. They never heard of this thing before. It's not a God. That's not real. But, hey, you know, we like the money that we get from the king. We like the protection we get from their police forces and their military. We like the water we get from their plumbing, right? And everybody else is doing it. No big deal. Nobody's going to notice. Nobody can pick you out of the crowd. And that's what people do. I say that because that's what people do. That's the normal, everyday way of conducting yourself in this world. That's how people act. But that is not what you do when you are a child of God, is it? In Exodus chapter 20, there was a commandment there. I seem to remember a commandment about this. <clears throat> Excuse me. I got my walk. I seem to remember a commandment about this. Ah, yes. It was the first one. <laughs> I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you slaves in Babylon. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself a carved image or statue, any likeness of anything in heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So there's only one God. It's the Lord. His likeness cannot be captured. And you cannot put forth any other likeness and pretend that it's him. Whether it is a 10-story tall gold statue in the plains of Babylon or whether it is a golden calf in the wilderness of Sinai. No graven images, no carved statues of any kind that purport to be the Lord that are there to be served or worshipped. Why? Because he is the real God. He is the one who brought you out of Egypt. And there's no likeness to it. You haven't seen his face. And he is jealous. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands who love me and keep my commandments. Which is to say, if you decide to worship other gods, there are going to be consequences for your children and your grandchildren, third, even the fourth generation of those who hate me. Not that God is going to punish them for your sins, but your sins, the consequences of what you do when you don't serve God are going to harm your children and your grandchildren. A poet said, they enslave their children who compromise with sin. It's true. That is the truth. And that's what this verse is telling us. So it's not a, perhaps you would say, a lack of clarity. Let's go back and think about this. Who is God? Oh, it's the Lord. What did he do? He brought this whole nation out of Egypt from the house of slavery. But they're slaves in Babylon right now. Okay, so what should you do? Should we go to... Babylon and its people and its commandments, its norms, go along to get along, blend into the crowd, appeal to the existing government and authority, or should you turn to the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts, the Lord who brought you out of the house of slavery? Hmm. Are there other gods? No. Are you allowed to come up with some kind of representation, a proxy for God? No. If you do so, God's angry with you. You hate him, he says. If you do this, you hate him. Which makes it kind of clear, I think. Are there going to be people who hate God in heaven? How many people who hate God do you think are going to die and go to heaven? Yeah, zero. That's not how it works. God is not a fool. So, yeah, that's pretty clear, I think. It's not a lack of clarity here, is it? It's the fire. Right? It's the fire. It's hot. There's a lot of pressure. You're under a lot of pressure to conform, to get along, to go along. It's many different things. <clears throat> I think that uh, this passage and the Revelation in, in general, the, the, the letter of the Revelation, help us, you know, if you think about it, you realize that the, the way that we suffer is not usually all at once. I mean, there are times when people have been threatened for their lives because of the faith. But that's relatively seldom. What does happen every day, constantly, across the globe to the children of God, are these little pressures, little nudges, little hints of something that you could do, that could be fun, that could be interesting, that you're missing out on, that you could be a part of, that if only I weren't a Christian, well, I could enjoy this, or those things are constant, and they're everywhere, and, and so what's really happening to us usually is death by a thousand paper cuts you know people are afraid of the sword but that's a very distant and remote possibility 
you should be a lot more concerned about the paper cuts because those happen all day, every day. And they can get you. The heat can become such that you decide to compromise. And that's the issue. All right. There is such a thing as a fire that can't be put out. <laughs> no respects paid to George. <laughs> Daniel 3, 6. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. This is the commandment of the King Nebuchadnezzar. So we brought you out here for this dedication. Little did you know we were going to spring a new God and a new idolatry on you, and it would have um, military enforcement. You must worship in the prescribed format, or we will kill you. In a burning, fiery furnace. And so, you know, <laughs> that's where you come in and you say, fire, you say right and the lord says challenge accepted right mark 9 43 if your hand causes you to sin cut it off it's better for you to enter life crippled than having two hands to go to hell the unquenchable fire you know that furnace burns out sometime it's not still there you know furnace burns out sometime hell never stops burning that's unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off, Mark 9, 45. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And 47, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Better to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That's Mark 9, 48. The worm does not die. The fire is not quenched. It never stops. It never ends. The fire is worse than anything we have here. It's worse than the pressures that we feel here. Much worse. And it never ends. There is no stopping. So, yes, um, Nebuchadnezzar thinks that he is scary and that his furnace is scary. But if you understand the teaching of Jesus, you really understand it, and you believe him that this is true about God, and this is true about life, then you realize, well, there are some other fires to be concerned about here. We made mention earlier of the fact that everyone is salted with fire, Mark 9, 49. Everyone salted with fire. So often people want to know, what is salt of the earth? Well, those are farmers. <laughs> well, I mean, I like farmers too. Who doesn't like farmers? But um, that's not the meaning. The salted with fire, the people of salt in Jesus' teaching, salted with fire meaning you get your distinctive flavor you get your character you get your your taste if you will from the fire you're being tested and you're coming through that test well makes you uh desirable to god that's salted with fire Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Right. See, the solution is not to make fire seem like it isn't hot. It is. The solution is to endure it. Because the only way to make the fire not hot, right, is to be singed and calloused you, you, if you burn severely on an arm then yeah you don't feel 
on that arm anymore. That's true. But being unfeeling is not the Christian life. That's not what you want. It isn't that the fire isn't hot. It's hot. But you can endure it. Because if it's not hot, as in if it doesn't bother you, well, then why are you going to obey God? If sin all around doesn't bother you, if pressure to do wrong doesn't bother you, then how are you going to serve God? How will you make it salty again? See, Peter wrote about this too, 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. He said, in salvation you rejoice, though now for a little while if necessary. You have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though tested by fire. The tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ is revealed. A little while. <laughs> What's that? It's your life. <laughs> your life is the little while he's talking about, while you're on earth. Which James also said is but a vapor just for a little while. And this is true. You can ask anybody who's over 90. I remember I witnessed it. it I was at Woodmont at the time. I witnessed it. There was a woman who, hmm, what was she? She might have been 100. But certainly in her 90s, a little kid, little girl asked her, ma'am, how long have you been alive? <laughs> and she said, uh, just a little while. The kid said, oh, that's not true. She said, oh, it is. <laughs> it is. It's true. So endure. Second Peter 1, also, same idea, but the ninth verse. Whoever lacks the qualities of the sound faith of salvation is so nearsighted as to be blind. Having forgotten, he was cleansed from his former sins. So we're still talking about how do you make it salty again? If it loses its flavor, if you fail to stand out from the crowd, if you will, shining his lights in this crooked and perverse generation, then you've forgotten your former cleansing. You forgot where you came from. Brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. If you practice these qualities, you'll never fall. And in a similar tone in the next chapter over, 2 Peter chapter 2, he says at verse 20, If after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if after this they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. That's what Jesus means. If it loses its saltiness, how do you make it salty again? If you escape the defilements of the world through the knowledge of Jesus, but then you become entangled in it and you become overcome by it again, that last state is worse than the first one was. Because what now? You already knew what Jesus did and what Jesus said. What now? How do we help? What can we say? It would have been better for them to never have known, never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Yeah. Why? Well, because God says so. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit. Which is true. If you have dogs, they do. And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Also true. This is what it's like to leave the world, become a Christian, and then go back to the world. It's the dog returning to its vomit. The, the pig returning 
to the mire after a bath. Not a good place to be. And that is, again, that is about salt, which is about fire, which is about the Lord. He is one God. And those who serve or bow before any other hate him. That's why there's hatred on that front end in Exodus 20, the hatred of God. And there's fire on the back end in the New Testament because those are tantamount. Those, those are, you know, tied together. You, you, got, you can't have one without the other. I think we have time for one, one more point. Um, in Daniel 3 and in Luke 16, it is a short point here, but I think we should say this in closing. At Daniel 3, 7 and 8, the people heard the sound, of course, and fell down and worshipped, as expected. And in the 8th verse at that time, that's why there was an occasion. Certain of the Chaldeans, that is, certain Babylonians, came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. I stop for a minute and say, the Jews? Or these three? Were there others? Where are they? Do you remember in chapter 1 of Daniel that uh, Daniel and these three in, in, that are here in, in chapter 3 um, asked to eat kosher food, to eat, to eat uh, vegetables so that they could keep the law of Moses? And at first there was, no, we can't do that because this is a program diet and we need to ensure that you progress. And they, they, they found a way with God's help, to make that happen. Remember that account that that happened? And it was all of the captive youth from Judah. Why were there only three, four of them who said, I want to eat what the law allows me to eat? Remember that we asked that question, why is it that the others are happy to feast on the king's delicacies? And there's only four of them who said, no, we're actually Jews. We're servants of God. And we need to eat according to the law of God. Why were there only four of them, right? We asked that question at that time, you may recall. And it's still a valid question. But the stakes are higher, you see. That was just, uh, no pun intended on stakes, but that was just the food at that time and what they'd been brought over for, and how the king was feeding them. They were just asking to eat kosher. You know, I mean, today it's an option when you buy an airplane ticket or something, you know, kosher meal. But at that time, it was, of course, unheard of. But now they're in the plane, and there's a statue, and they're being commanded to fall before a statue and worship. It is the very first commandment in the Ten Commandments. It couldn't be any clearer that this is dead wrong. And absolutely not, you cannot do this. Where are the other ones? Right? The reason is, Luke 16, 10, one who's faithful in a very little is faithful in much. One who's dishonest in a very little is dishonest in much. So this is the trick when it comes to the fire. We talked earlier about the sword and the paper cut, remember? The fact is, they're all swords. You know? They're all swords. Because any sin separates you from your God. You don't walk in those things. They're everywhere, and they're quite dangerous. But 
that's the truth. If you're faithful in little, then you're faithful in much. If you're not faithful in little, you'll be not faithful in much either. Oh, the kosher laws, well, you know, you could see people saying, hey, you know, when in Rome, do as the Romans, or, yeah, but, you know, we are not in Israel anymore, or whatever it might be. You could maybe understand arguing about that from a foolish young person perspective, but fall down and worship a statue that is a foreign god? Is there any confusion about that at all? No, but there shouldn't be confusion about the fact that they're not going to do that either because they were never really serving God. They had the name that they were Christians. They followed the, the, the symbols of it or the patterns of it. They, you know, they went to church. They didn't use instruments, you know, didn't give to orphans homes, you know, whatever. Followed all of the rules, checked all the boxes, so it seemed. But the problem is, God is looking at your daily life and the choices that you make and the priorities that you set for your life. And if it's not faithful in little things, it's not faithful in big things either. When the test comes, when something really, really big happens, that could be the last one for you. You become the one who falls away. You become the one who leaves the Lord. You know, you become the one who teaches error, who splits the church. These people come from somewhere. It's not usually from outside, you know. Seldom does somebody obey the gospel fresh out of the world and become this great influence, a writer, a teacher, a professor at a college that everybody listens to and follows their error, and it destroys churches across the land. Seldom is that an outsider. Almost always, that's one of us who has been in this thing for many, many years, right? How did they get there? Yeah, boiling a frog, maybe. Or maybe they never were really doing what they should have been doing in the first place. The priorities weren't right. But little by little, right? Bit by bit. That's the real fire that we are subject to. And so that's what we're talking about. Do you love the truth? Do you love the Lord? Do you understand if you will, do you understand that it matters, the choices that we make, the small ones too. That shows where our dedication to him is. An understanding of the basics is critical for an understanding of the complex things. But a faithfulness in the smallest things, a willingness, a gumption to stand up in the face of adversity or heat or scrutiny, you need that. Everybody needs that to be pleasing to God. Do not forget that we are, as created beings in the universe, we are eternal souls, and our purpose is to glorify God. And God is glorified when we choose to serve him. Always glorified by automatons as well, I understand. The earth glorifies him, the heavens declare his glory, I get it. But when we, of our self-will, of our own choice, decide to serve him, especially when we decide to serve him and it hurts us to our own detriment, that glorifies him even more. And when somebody threatens or problems come or trouble comes and you stay faithful and serve him, that glorifies him even more. So... Don't forget, it's not about checking the boxes. It's about glorifying God, staying with him, being faithful to him, being loyal to him, no matter the cost, because that's where the glory is. And that's when your home is in heaven. Today, are we speaking and you're not a Christian? You need to make heaven your home by obeying the gospel of Jesus. Obeying the gospel of Jesus involves Believing in him, that he is the son of God, that he's resurrected from the dead. That you too can be resurrected. That you can be forgiven. Of course you can be forgiven. Jesus is raised from the dead. You're not dead. You can be forgiven. God can help you. You have to be buried together with him in baptism in water for forgiveness of sins. That you might be resurrected together with him. 
His blood washes away everything. No special power in the water. Just that that's what he said to do. That's what they did all over the New Testament. So today, are you a Christian? Have you been baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness? Well, do it before it's too late. But if you are a Christian, you have done that. Have you lived faithfully? Have you discharged your duty to him? Do so. Repent if not. Pray God for forgiveness. And we'll pray with you too if we can, because none of us is above temptation. I don't say these things to you. I say these for all. These lessons are for me, too, you understand. We're, we're servants here. You're not the audience. God is the audience. <laughs> we are all performing. You're worshiping. I'm worshiping. I'm in the role of evangelist right now, and you're in a different role. But God is the audience. We're serving him. So, yeah, I am tempted, too. Yeah, I fail, too. I, I say things I shouldn't say. I give in to temptations to make life easier, or so it seems. Yeah. It's true, I do that. I know better, I shouldn't do it. And so we do, we need prayers. None of us is above temptation. None of us is, is in some kind of sinless perfection. That's not the deal. The deal is the prayers of righteous people work. God hears it. So if you need today the prayers of the saints or you need to be baptized in his name, let it be known at this time by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.